Roll on his back. We're hitting our zone two stride. Yes, sir. Adam, should we do the show? I think so. There's so much to discuss this. It's not a week. It's like, a, it's not a two weeks. It's been, th- is it, th- is it a, what's a three week? Is it an epoch? Is that an epoch three weeks? Let's just stop with the distractions. Let's just fucking do the show. Born in 1966. He turned his life around. He wasn't doing so hot. He got rid of that weight and he gained a lot of wisdom. He lives in a tent. Thank you all so much for playing along. And I hope you have a wonderful night. And I'd like to welcome to the stage, Mr. Rich. Hey everybody, welcome to Roll On, where the grounded, good-natured, but sometimes cantankerous journalist and author Adam Skolnick and I clip matters of interest from the internet and real life. We opine on sports, culture, entertainment, self-betterment, and occasionally, sometimes against my better instincts, politics. We answer a listener question here and there and so much more. So today we got plenty of news from the front lines of endurance including, we hope at this point, a very special and exclusive call with the newly crowned Ironman world champion, Christian Blumenfeld and his coach, Olav Alexander. We may or may not get a little bit political today. We answer a listener question and we're gonna close with another coaching call check-in with a friend of the podcast, personal friend, Chris Houth. But first, how goes it, my comrade? Rich, I'm perplexed. Mm. You're into wellness, right? Would you describe yourself as a wellness guy? Uh, I, I don't like labels, okay. Adam. But I, the reason I bring it up- I'm is into wellness, yes. You're into wellness. I think you're the guy- I'm, to, I'm a wellness influencer. You're, <laughs> you're a well-fluencer. Yeah. I think you're the guy. I think I've got, actually, I think I've got a new podcast episode for you, but it's all about the movable itch. You know, like, what is it about- That sounds the, like a book title. Right, but like- what is it about the human body where you have an, an itch on your back, someone scratches it for you, and then it moves just so slightly up or down, sometimes to the side, and then you have to tell them to move, and then they scratch it, and you say harder, and then it moves again. It leaps, frogs around. How come we've never figured out why that happens? I don't know. We should get Andrew Huberman in here. That's what I'm thinking. This is a Huberman pod waiting <laughs> yeah, to happen. He's right. got a guy. You know, he's got a guy at Stanford. I'm sure he has an answer for this. <laughs> he's got a guy at Stanford looking at this. What's interesting to me is like, I don't, you know, I don't walk around itching and scratching myself, but when I go to bed at night and I'm lying in bed and right before I'm about to fall asleep, suddenly I'll have like an unbearable itch that I have to scratch. <laughs> and, and then I do it. Right and in then, the middle. And then it's somewhere else after that. And I'm like, I didn't have to do this 10 minutes ago. It's my point. Right. It's a human, it's a this, human this problem. Is, yeah, this is a, uh, this is one for the ages. I, I must get to the bottom of this. I, I think we got to do a full pod <laughs> just on the movable itch. Okay. How about a whole series? <laughs> whole series a six on six part it. limited series? <laughs> yes, yes. For Netflix? <laughs> a Netflix doco. <docker. laughs> okay. <laughs> Why? Um, all right. Well, I know you love sharks. I do. We have some, we we have some shark news. Today, yeah, yeah. That, I've got a I've got a couple of uh, stories out this last week. One came out Thursday. Bef- we're recording this on a Monday. It came out the last Thursday for outside, but it'll be wide. It'll be available wide uh, for all comers uh, the same day this pod drops. So that's good news. It's about um, it's based on a reporting trip I did to La Paz in southern Baja, and it's it's all about. Um, a marine biologist and her her pals who started a uh, foundation nonprofit down in Southern Baja to get the shark fishermen uh, who live there uh, to start to see sharks not as to get them to see that they're worth more alive than dead, basically. Mm-hmm. And so there's there's um, eighty plus shark fishing villages and camps in Southern Baja. There has been for uh, you know four or five generations. Um, they used to use kind of. In, uh, used to be like they're all artisanal fishermen. They just they just use a line and a hook, 
They're not, they're not going out there with nets. Um, and they've been doing it for generations. They've been sending shark fins to Hong Kong since the 30s. It was never a big problem until, uh, until the outboard motors came along and competition became more fierce. And now they have to go miles offshore. It used to be sharks, they can get them in the bay. Now they have to go miles and miles offshore. They get paid very little because the shark numbers are down so much. Uh, I think worldwide, it's 70% of sharks have been killed, basically, that were once here. That's the, that's the number mm -hmm. I could come across. Um, and, and so because of that, the sharks are smaller, the fins are smaller. They're earning about $150 a week doing this kind of job and it's dangerous they're going miles offshore in little pongas um and let, to be clear yeah. they're uh they're they're fishing for sharks to cut their fins off and sell them yep right yeah and they're not really able to make a living doing this so can we not transition them into that's some other this is type all about. of career yeah that's that's the whole okay. point of the story <laughs> Thanks. so here's a problem <laughs> Uh, like if you That's look up the on the screen point. there, I, I have the article pulled up on outside, yeah. but then I come here and it says, become a member, <laughs> unlock this and, and get other great perks. And I'm like, I don't know that I'm, I'm I tried to log in. I, I don't think I'm, I have so many subscriptions. I know. And it's like, I'm trying to sell you another one. I know. So I, know. I actually didn't read your article. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Even story. though I'm proud of you. <laughs> I'm proud of you. Thanks for bringing it uh, in, kid. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, you'd think... I don't know. Well, I mean, the, look, I was on the cover of this magazine, Humble Brag. Oh, uh, so can't they can't they spot me a subscription? You know, you'd be. Sure. I, I think I actually do have a subscription. I just right. don't know what my login credentials are. I bought my subscription because even though I've been writing for them for years and years, I've, they've. You know, that's so funny. I would think that as a contributor to any publication, I should just get a free subscription. It's they never should. happened. Never really? happened. Have no one's heard, ever have offered you, me. Have you asked though? No. That should be a perk. I'm non-confrontational. I don't want to have that conversation. It might be beneficial to actually be able to read the publication that you're contributing It should to. be a perk. It should be like automatically you contribute like maybe not once, but if you contribute two or three times, they should just be feeding it to uh -huh. you. Even yeah. the New York Times? No, I, I pay for that. You do? Yeah. I've never asked. Mm. Maybe I'm going to start asking. You should ask. Uh -huh. Stand up for yourself. Thank you. Adam Skolnick. I will. But that's exactly so anyway, what the story is about. It's, right. about, it's about the efforts to um, get people to stop shark fishing. But the real problem there isn't isn't just the fact that they're fishing for sharks and it's a, and, and it's endangering the shark populations. It's that there are um, mainland Mexico industrial fishing operations that come to Southern Baja and take up these huge drift nets and go in one go in one day, they can mm -hmm. take more tuna than these guys fish for bait when they use tuna for bait for these sharks. They, they get more in one day than these shark fishermen can get in a year. And that's what's destroying the, uh, the economy and the ecology. And so there is a group of people uh, led by these marine biologists in La Paz that is trying to get the entire of, entirety of Southern Baja as one MPA that allows for fishing, allows for sport fishing, spear fishing, and artisanal fishing. And so they don't want to take the livelihood away but it cuts off industrial fishing forever. Mm -hmm. And that can really do good. So the, the point is to try to get these guys boats that are, are fit for tourists, to get them tourists to come, to train them, to be able to, to take tourists out, to look at the amazing wildlife. I mean, Southern Baja, especially around La Paz, has some of the most amazing wildlife in the world. It's like uh, the, the con confluence of equatorial currents and Alaskan currents that come down from, from Northern California, from Alaska all the way down past California to Mexico, that confluence means it's like a haven for several species of whale, several species of sharks, whale sharks, uh, sea lions, you name it. Right. And so it's an incredible place to go. Obviously uh, under threat by the industrial fishing industry. That's right. And yeah. the problem is, is that industrial fishing uh, businesses and their people who represent them have convinced sport fishermen and artisanal fishermen that MPAs are bad for them, when in reality, the opposite has been proven to be true. So the point here, and it's even not, MPAs aren't even bad for industrial fishermen. It's just, it's, it just means they have to pause in certain areas. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it, guess where a lot of the fishing fleet is near the Galapagos? They're right at the end edge of the Galapagos National Park. Well, why is that? Because the Galapagos National Park pr produces such biodiversity that it doesn't support it all. People have the the, the, the animals have to move, and so mm -hmm. when they move out, you know, you're you're mm -hmm. basically feeding the rest of the ocean right, right, right. with wildlife. Right. So that's 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 why MPAs are great. So this gets into a little bit of all of that, right? And then you followed that up with another article. 
yeah, story came out today. I wrote it uh, actually a little while ago, but they they posted it today. Um, it's about a free diver, a hundred and five meter free immersion free diver named Denis Gromer. Um, he lives in Tikehau and the Tuamotus in French Polynesia. And I met him out there and just stayed in touch with him. He is amazing because in his spare time, when he's not leading tourists around on on fun, you know manta dives and and training to be a great free diver, he literally goes out there and does the octopus teacher thing with. 14 foot tiger sharks. Right. So <laughs> the New York Times article online yeah. opens with this incredible video mm. of him just out there messing around with these tiger sharks. Mm -hmm. We're watching, you know, a gigantic one swim right past him right now as he sort of pets it. Yeah. He pets them, he hugs them, he 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 tries to kiss them. Doesn't always well, go well. Well, there's the one story in the article <laughs> about where, yeah, he leaned down to kiss to kiss the shark and realized his head was inside its mouth. Yes. I saw and that. And he footage. narrowly escaped. Yeah, I saw that. Being footage. decapitated. That's right. By his buddy. That's right. Because he names Lover. all the, he Lover. yeah he Lover. names all the sharks right. Yeah. Yes. And he knows them. He identifies them. He knows their personalities. He's a real wild man. He loved octopus teacher. So like that is basically a great. I tried to put that reference into the story. It got cut out by three different editors. So mm. I just guess it wasn't right. a good one. So but, check that out. That's in print today, right? Yeah. And what's interesting about Denis Gromer is he is product of a single mom, grew up in uh, remote French Polynesia. His older brother, Jody Gromer, was a world champion Brazilian jiu-jitsu fighter. And his younger brother is Tika Nui Smith, um, who is one of the great surfers uh, at Chopo in, oh, wow. in Tahiti. So, wow. yeah. So like <laughs> so, a, just a, a lineage what a family. of water people. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, that's cool. How do you find these people in these stories? Uh, you know, I happened to be out in Tahiti uh, and in French Polynesia. I went to Tiki Hau, um, and I heard about him out there and I got introduced to him. And so basically he took me out on his boat, took April and I out um, and we cruised around and swam with mantas and saw where he lived and just hung out, did some spear fishing, um, saw a big shark come by when he caught a fish and it, that looked like that was, that's the biggest, angriest shark I've ever been that close to. It was, uh, it was a silver tip shark. And I'd never seen one. I didn't know. I, it looked like an oceanic white tip to me. It was a big, mm. burly shark, and its fins were down, and it was hunting. And he had just speared a fish and had to pull it out of the water. <laughs> it went down. And then he puts the fish on the boat, and then he hands me the spear, and he goes, okay, it's your turn. And then I look down, there's this silhouette of that giant angry shark is like right below me. I'm like, really? So what does that mean when its <laughs> fins are down? That's an indication that it he's just hunting? Looked, it looked like it, you know, like it looked like, you know, the body language of the shark looked like it was, it was hungry. Mm. <laughs> and you're tasty. Right. But usually sharks don't look yeah. like that. They look like this. Although cool. its fins are down, but it doesn't look, it looks very calm, right? Yeah, you can yeah, tell. Yeah. Yeah. Nice, man. Cool. Yeah. What else are you working on? That's it, you know, we're in book world as well, but uh, that's that's all I can report on now, Rich. How are you? How are I was, you? I was, how I was just you? waiting no, for you to you? ask. You know, how I'm just, you? I'm not really listening to you. I'm just <laughs> waiting until it's my turn to talk, Adam. <laughs> how are you? <laughs> I'm good. We had a nice Mother's Day yes. yesterday with the kids, which was great. The main thing with me is my back is not doing very well. So about four or five days ago, it just really seized up on me. So I've been in rather excruciating pain that I believe must be exacerbated by the um, uptick in the swim training that I've been doing. Yeah. Um, so much so that like I can't sit up in bed or when I sit in a chair, you'll see when we're done with this podcast, when I go to stand up, it's like I can't stand up straight. It's really painful. And I'm in the middle of undergoing this, this pretty advanced high-tech therapy that involved, did I talk about this last time? No. So I went up to the Bay Area uh, a couple of weeks ago to visit this clinic where I was injected with PRP, platelet replacement therapy, okay. um, peptides, and also this derivative from placenta. It's kind of like a, okay. a stem cell analog. Yep. And over the course of a four hour period, got dozens of injections in my back, which I was told would not be painful, but turned out to be excruciatingly painful Does because Samuel, my muscles. Did Samuel Alito uh, authorize that yeah, use of no. placenta? We're going to get to that. Okay. Yeah. Not yet. Soon. I would, <laughs> Don't tell I would him. Imagine. Do not tell him. Yes. Liberty. Um, it was actually very painful because my muscles are so jacked up back there. Right. And it's a long process. I've been told that it could take up to six months. They're relatively optimistic about their ability to kind of 
help me out. Essentially, I have Spondy and my L4 protrudes about a centimeter towards my abdomen. So it's out of whack and it's pinching these nerves and it's just causing all kinds and that's of called spondy? And pain. Spondylolisthesis, okay. I think is how you say it. Um, and what does the placenta cells do? What do they well, do? Well, as I understand it, and you know, I probably should have researched this a little bit more to speak more you know, uh, informed about it, but essentially it's a, it's a solution of, of sort of like stem cells where they can, they can kind of go repair certain areas and become whatever is needed in yeah. order to like, you know, basically Sorry. solve the problem. Um, so it's basically this solution of these different things that my lower back is now being bathed in that over time will help regenerate the kind of fluid around the, um, the L4 and create a, b a bit more space that relaxes the muscles. And that will in time allow that L4 to kind of go back in place where it's meant to. Okay. Um, but in the meantime, I'm in a lot of pain and you okay. know, I'm probably in jeopardy of being able to do this 20 kilometer swim race because I had a big block over the weekend that I was supposed to execute on, but I just, I, you know, I can't, I, 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 I can barely move right now, oh, man. which is not fun. You look great. That's so, a great looking cardigan. Yeah, I wish I could be in the pool though. I know. You know, and I think it has to do with the turns and the flip turns. Right. It's, it's not necessarily the swimming because I've been swimming a lot and not running for the sole purpose of not doing anything that is creating that kind of jarring impact. Right. But I think pushing off the walls and, the, you know, when you flip and you arch your back that way, I could tell like I was starting to get a lot of strain doing that. And yeah. I think that really exacerbated the situation. So, oh, you got a ping. I got a ping. But basically, Olaf just pinged you. Yes. They're in the Denver airport. They're going to grab something to eat and yeah. then make themselves available to check in, which is a good segue into kind of what we wanted to talk about next in our 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 typical endurance sports check-in corner of the show, which is that this past Saturday was Ironman St. George, yes. which happened to be the 2021 World Championships of yes. Ironman, which is hilarious because we're halfway to 2023 it is, at this It is point. hilarious. It is funny. A result of them canceling Kona during the pandemic, yep. there's still going to be the 2022 World Championships in Kona in October, right? right. So this That's is right. like the delayed World Championship it's from like the, the previous year. It's like the Oscars, except a World Championship <laughs> yeah, race. I, I guess, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you want to just set the stage yeah. for what went so, down here? So basically it was meant to be kind of the, the, the I guess, put up or shut up time for the Norwegians, right? Who've been put, throwing down incredible times at races. Christian won the Tokyo gold. Then he had the um, fastest ever full distance tri Ironman triathlon in Cozumel. Gustav won a race as well at a really, really fast time. Um, Gustav Eden. Um, and so it's supposed to be their time. Are they going to be who they, everyone says they are or not? I think there was the the smack talk from Alistair uh, Brownlee, Brownlee saying, you know, do you believe the hype train or don't believe no, that? I don't think that was Brownlee. No, it was that other British guy, oh, who, ended guy. Up, who ended up uh, dropping out. So Apologies. yeah, a lot of these Apologies. guys ended up not competing. So yeah. it was meant to be the showdown between Blumenfeld, Eden, Ferdino, and yeah. possibly Brownlee. But Ferdino, Eden, and Brownlee were all out. Yeah, but Ferdino, you know, that was a really, but it, it didn't surprise me because he loves Kona so much. So maybe he's like Saving putting himself. everything everything on Kona. Maybe. Yeah. So going into this race, it looked like it was going to be a showdown between Blumenfeld, Lionel Sanders, and Cameron Wirth. Yeah. Um, and Blumenfeld, just crushed it. He got out of the water, I don't know, like four minutes back or something like that. Found himself in no man's land on the bike, um, a bit behind the lead pack, but ahead of the second pack. And he just kind of waited for Cameron Wirth to catch up to him and, and paced himself off of Cameron, uh, got off the bike and then just killed the run. Mm. Just crushed I mean, it. he was, what was he like f uh, four minutes back on the bike, four and a half minutes, 446 yeah, behind, like finished almost five minutes clear. Um, did his, I think he did a 238 Right, marathon. so he just worked his way through the pack. I don't think he took the lead until like mile 18. That's right. And he averaged 602 miles running. Um, 602 like per mile. 520 miles around mile 20. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the, the amazing thing about all of this is that he did it with a virus. Like he was yes. not 100%. No. I mean, his coach said he was 90%. Gustav he, couldn't couldn't even start. Right. Gustav, he, yeah, they had the same thing. 
And and uh, didn't Olaf say that you know if it hadn't been the World Championships, yes. he wouldn't he wouldn't have started. And yeah. he like vomited right before the race and vomited afterwards. He looked like he was vomiting right at the end, right when he yeah. got there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Olaf said that he would not have started him if it wasn't the World Championship. But then the fact that he rocked it so hard i mean and it was i just love the way he finishes these races he shows so much emotion the same thing in tokyo and just like you know he wants he wants to be the best and it's fun to see an athlete that admits that and then you know these guys called their shot like olav mm -hmm. um had said in the article i wrote about these guys that it's going to be like taking candy from a baby to win the iron man world championship i mean that's huge words for someone who at that point hadn't even done a full distance race yet yeah and so to see that kind of, uh, you know, I guess you have to go back for old timers, Joe Namath and that kind of thing, like the Babe Ruth, call your shot. Like it just doesn't happen. It's very rare that it happens. Commentators do it, but athletes tend not to do it and coaches tend not to do it, but they did it and they backed it up. It's pretty amazing. Right, when you yeah. when you say it out loud and then you back it up. It's amazing. I mean, it makes it makes for a pretty great story. <laughs> and I does. think this is just the beginning. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, it's you certainly know? setting up that way. He's 26 years old, I believe. Right. And, um, and then Gustav is also right there and we'll see what he's got. I mean, shout out to Lionel Sanders for an amazing finish. I mean, just an incredible- He's an animal. Oh, he's he an looked animal. like he was just yeah. a beast. He's an animal. And it's crazy that he can run as well as he does because he's got this wacky form. Yeah, I love it. I um, love his form. He's got an amazing backstory. I've been trying to get him on the podcast forever because uh, his backstory is, is unbelievable. And now he spends a lot of time training in Arizona, but he's from Canada. And traditionally, he spends most of the year in his basement where he has an infinity pool and a treadmill and his bike on a trainer. And he never leaves this tiny room <laughs> and he does all of his training indoors like on, in his basement. Like in a small pool with like a treadmill thing. Yeah, you know, those little, yeah. like those little, yes. you know, pools where they have yes. a circular current yeah. or whatever. So he has, it's literally like this setup that's just, you know, in this room. In that Tucson. He essentially, no, no, in Canada. In Canada, okay. Where it's inclement most of the time. Right. He can't ride outdoors. So, you know, when it's snowing outside, he's just in this room for like nine hours a day. Crazy. Training. Now he does, I think he's in, he spends time in Palm Springs and in Arizona. He does lots of camps there. Yeah. So I don't know how much he's doing that now, but there are these amazing videos that Talbot Cox made way back in the day. They right. were like a day in the life of, of Lionel Sanders. And he's just in this room, you know, just like, and he can suffer. You know, he just oh, pushes himself clearly. so hard. Clearly. Um, also, shout out to Cameron Wirth. This mm -hmm. guy, for people who don't know, is just an extraordinary athlete. Yeah. Um, he is a pro cyclist, a domestique for Ineos. And he's been living in Europe, riding races for this team. And he just got back like from racing Perry roubaix where... He uh, helped his team win. He was the domestique supporting Dylan Van Barl, who took the win uh, and and like left that and just goes right to St. George to compete in the Ironman World Championships. He's like, I haven't swum, you know, at all. Like he's, you know, he hasn't been focused on, on Ironman really at all. And shout out to Cameron for being a semi-Calabasas native. He spends a lot oh. of time out here training. He nice. was out here training with Garen Thomas, who was the 2018 Tour de France winner. So he's a bit of a uh, uh, temporary local out in these parts. Nice. And if you're out riding your bike, you probably have seen him riding around. Out you got You got to. You got to get him into the studio. I'd love to have him on. Yeah. So Cameron, if you're listening, next time you swing through LA, let's make that happen. Shout out also. Oh well, two other. Th one last thing on Christian. He's the first to ever win the Olympic gold and the Ironman title in a, in a calendar year. Right. And um, so that's amazing. Only the second ever to have both. But uh, mm. I think there was several years between Jan winning the gold and then winning the Ironman. So it doesn't usually happen that quickly. It happened for them. Shout out to Daniela Ree for fifth world title. She finished in eight, 30, eight hours and 34 minutes. Third most titles ever right. on the women's side. She won by almost nine minutes. Right. And in, in, the, in the women's race, the big um, omission was Lucy Charles Barkley, who mm. did not compete due mm. to an injury. So awesome. So why don't we take a quick break and we'll be back with a quick Zoom check-in with Christian Blumenfeld and his coach Olaf Alexander Boo live from the Denver airport. Prophets Walk Among Us. As a writer and podcaster for nearly 10 years, I've become more convinced than ever that our world is populated by scores of beautiful and brilliant people who have amazing stories to share. 
Those that we don't know who can teach us something new and leave us all the better for the experience of their sharing. And so I've dedicated my career to tracking down the most compelling prophets on the planet, going deep with each of them on my podcast to elucidate the best of what they have to offer and to sharing the insights gleaned for the benefit of all. But the podcast is not the only medium by which to share their stories, which is why I'm proud to announce the release of my new book, Voicing Change, Volume 2. More than mere words on paper, Voicing Change is a physical manifestation of the magic, inspiration, and timeless wisdom that transpires each week on the Ritual Podcast. The first edition of Voicing Change was a beautifully rendered book worthy of display on any coffee table. And volume two follows in that tradition by showcasing even more of my favorite conversations in an elegant publication replete with interview excerpts, essays, and stunning photography, making for an exquisite companion to the first volume or a satisfying standalone work. Picking up this book allows you to revisit the wisdom of your favorite everyday prophets and physically interact with the life-changing ideas contained within. Voicing Change Volume 2, available now while supplies last for a limited time. Order your copy today only at richroll.com. All right. Yeah. There, there they are. The champion. How are we doing? <laughs> How are you guys doing? Thank you so much for taking time. You're at the you're at the airport. You got a layover, and I appreciate you just taking a couple minutes and finding a quiet space to to talk to us. So, we won't take up too much of your time, but we're happy to be able to congratulate you. What an amazing performance! And we're anxious to kind of hear your thoughts in the wake of making history in the triathlon world. Well, yeah. First of all, thank you so much. Um, uh, it was quite the tricky kind of preparation I would say like uh, I did my first winning in Cosmo like six months ago now and I thought I would feel more prepared coming into this one but uh, I think uh, we maybe did a little bit a little bit too much time up in altitude so I didn't feel too fresh coming to St. George we came at three weeks early to kind of just nail the course and do the preparation there but then I managed to get uh, uh, a cold like first week, so it, it was kind of uh, feeling that I hadn't done everything I could. Like I was kind of uh, wasn't sure how my fitness would be or how my body would be responding. But luckily, I was able to do like one solid bike ride. Like went through the whole course the week before, felt all right, and the same on the run. So that kind of gave me the confidence that on race day I would be. I could be good and uh, yeah, had a good, good day. I would say, uh, especially on the bike in the run, I was able to produce good power and uh, was very strong into land. So happy with that. Yeah. I think that's an understatement. Well, Olaf, you had said uh, you went on record saying that, uh, you know, Christian was not well. He was fighting a virus. Gustav had to drop out for having the same, uh, same illness. And Christian, you you like vomited before the race. I mean, Olaf, you had said he was at 90%. Sounds like he might've even been operating at less than 90% and still capable of, you know, putting in the performance that we all witnessed. Yeah, up in altitude, uh, we there were actually several people starting to get sick. Some people we even heard uh, got COVID. So we were actually a little bit afraid that uh, people had been catching COVID or, or guys have got, got COVID, but... Uh, we did, uh, I'll say, the testing and everything just to ensure that that was not the case. So it, we got confirmed that it was a cold. Uh, so Gustav was the first one to, or he, he, he got it from somebody uh, up there. Then, uh, uh, but he eventually, we dropped it. I'll say, we, we reduced the training quite significantly, focused on getting him back as quickly as possible. And then being able to nail in like one good preparatory session. Uh, um, yeah, uh, that we had optimized from after our leading into Cozumel. And uh, then when we came to St. George, of course, we were really surprised by the dry conditions. And of course, this is cha challenging, especially because it dries out the mucous membranes. So you are less protected from viruses and bacteria. 
Christian, when we landed, uh, got sick and actually got quite, I would say, got a quite severe cold. So actually not only upper respiratory system, but actually also the lower. So in the in the lungs as well, uh, coughing slime. And uh, yeah, it was pretty severe. Um, uh, yeah, same of course, you can't do anything then just bring down and focus on getting as quickly as possible fresh. Went to the doctor, did all kinds of blood works uh, to, again, also ensure that it's not COVID, that it's not, not any viruses that can potentially... The last thing you want to do is to push yourself when you have uh, this... Or let's say you are having an infection that can potentially call myocarditis or other long-term, long-term issues for you. So I wanted to rule out all that. And then uh, I kept daily dialogue with the team doctor in Norway as well. Um, and uh, as Christian was starting to recover, uh, unfortunately, Gustav is maybe as a little bit more exposed because he also has asthma. So coming to dry climates like St. George, um, uh, we needed to start to use, uh, uh, yeah, try to moisturize the air, got humidifiers, and so on. Sorry, sorry, Christian. Yeah. Imagine if, imagine if you weren't sick before an Iron Man, what you could do. <laughs> <laughs> That's two races, right? You had the, you had the stomach thing in Cozumel, and then this. So ho- hopefully, third time lucky. Is that what we're saying when we come coming to Hawaii? That that that, that would be my race. <laughs> you had an amazing race, Christian. Congratulations, you. Um, what was going through your mind when you were kind of in the no man's land on the bike and how, how, how close to, according to plan, did everything go for you? Yeah. So the swim, I, I did, should have been up there on the swim, but I felt just so weak, uh, I was standing there on the start line. So before the race, we had five minutes in the water where we could uh, warm up. And after two minutes, I started kind of vomiting because my throat was so kind of bad and irritated. So I felt quite, uh, I, like I said, I wasn't really on fire when I was waiting for the gun to go and had a weak swim, two minutes or so behind. Tried to catch up, but I just lost time on the first 40, 50K on the bike. Uh, so we went from like 2.30 to 3.30. And then I had a camera behind me and or like 40 seconds behind. So I thought, like, okay, now I'm just going to let my computer and just refocus, wait for the guys behind, and then give it one final shot for the race. Like <laughs> it's almost like I was giving up, but I also tried to think that uh, <laughs> it's it's not over until it's over. And a typical Ironman mantra, and just focusing on doing the nutrition, getting in a lot of liquid, and then uh, carbs and more than just to be prepared for a final half marathon. So Olaf, during the race, uh, what is the sort of uh, approach that you're taking as a coach? What are you looking for? What is the data that you're trying to extract from Christian's performance? And when you guys get home and start, you know, wading through all of it, what are you looking to learn and hone going into Kona in the fall? I think during the race, because of the conditions and uh, Christian has a not being fully recovered from the race, Gustav, of course, still uh, too sick to to race or where it was not safe for him to race. Um, I actually didn't know what to expect going in there because it's uh, 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 there are so many things that can 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 happen, um, and also because there was a lot of other people also that were sick. I was actually I, I one of the things that I was pretty sure about was that the dynamics of the race would be quite different than if you had uh, like a lot of the like favorites that was all expected favorites on, on the start line because then people don't want to take equally big big of a risk. Now suddenly when there are a lot of them were out, the podium is more open and people are more willing to take risk. Uh, and it's like more make it or break it. So uh, actually, I we, I worked together with uh, with Adam, uh, the manager, and uh, we also had several of our tech tech uh, partners there. So I was discussing. They were they were asking, of course, the same question, and I actually said that I, we just have to see. Uh, first, he needs to come out of the swim. Uh, if he comes out of the swim, okay, and he goes on the bike, of course, I get a glimpse, and you, I could see him. Then uh, 
you get at least a little bit a feel of whether he's like completely deflated or at least it's still game on. And then uh, already for the first part of the bike, you get a good idea at least of okay, how is the feel? Because it's more than looking at the tracker. Because I don't have a, I don't have access to to real time data. Uh, so I have to follow the tracker and see how the rest of the field plays out. And uh, when I saw that, first, of course, I saw the five guys in the front, they, they were riding hard. I knew Christian, what, what numbers he had been doing leading into the race. So, and I know uh, how, strong, uh, how strong he is. So I knew that if people were starting to go much faster than Christian, I knew also they were probably overpacing. Uh, and but again, he's six, so you don't know whether they are going faster because they are going at the ordinary pace, or whether it's Christian going a little bit slower because he doesn't feel hundred um, uh, percent. But then when I saw Cameron Worth coming up and Sanders coming up, and I still see that the front group of the five guys are still making uh, uh, room uh, down to Christian Cameron. Uh, and uh, and uh, Sanders, I knew Sanders was uh, fresh. He had he he, he was uh, healthy. Cameron uh, was healthy, so I used them a little bit as a coach to understand a little bit how fast the front group was riding. And then also I saw that one of the guys that has been running or been quite strong before, like uh, Daniel Beckigo, I saw that he was starting to drop down to fifth position in the group there, and that was like an indicator for me because he knew he had to run probably fast also to be able to be in position to do something. And when I saw he fell down and was sitting on the back of the group, then I, then I was thinking, okay, now he's, he's falling down to fifth position. He has been riding too hard. He needs to try or try to basically re recover as much as possible. So he's in position to be able to run. Um, and then when they came off on the, out of the bike and, and, and uh, uh, started to run, of course, uh, Christian looked, uh, looked sharp. Uh, so then I was pretty confident already that okay, this gonna Christian is gonna bring this home. So Christian, um, what is that like for you? Are you getting are you getting communications at all from Olav? Are you just kind of are you getting splits on your watch? I saw you looking at your watch a lot on the run. Are you what what were you looking at and how did it feel to finally pass um, the leader at mile eighteen? Yeah, so throughout the whole bike, like you get very few. Uh, or you get a lot of splits from the people on the course, but it's very like you can't really trust the splits whether they're using just uh, taking the splits themselves, which or if they are kind of just using all splits from the uh, live tracker. So it's quite confusing. Uh, and it's, there was only two like out and back section where I could take the splits myself. Uh, so, but uh, for the whole bike ride, basically. I was just kind of getting negative feedback. Like I was losing a little bit and a little bit and a little bit until maybe the hundred K. And from there on, we were kind of staying within the four and a half minute gap and was st stabilizing there. But ideally I wanted to kind of bridge up again. Uh, so coming into the run, I wasn't sure like how my run legs would be, but I felt quite smoked <laughs> at the some part of the bike like there going up uh, the two big climbs uh, but I was thinking that if I go out on the run on my limits then uh, at least it's kind of giving it a try and it, at least running for a podium because no way that all five of those guys will be kind of able to put the marathon together we saw like I was expecting some some of them to blow up uh, so in the beginning, I was just running for a podium. And uh, for the first 10K, I think I was running in the same speed as Brendan Curry, the guy from New Zealand. Mm -hmm. uh, and I knew that he could be a good runner. And I kind of started, okay, thinking that he's maybe out of territory. I, I can't really catch him. But then on the way back again, I suddenly kind of bridged back two minutes out of those four and a half. And then I was only two and a half minutes behind with a half marathon to go. And that was kind of the moment when I think so that I can actually start winning this. Got like the pictures in my head of myself uh, winning the race. And I just had to kind of keep, keep focus and uh, make sure that I still did the nutrition and hydration correctly and took as much fluid as I could in the aid station just to stay cool. Amazing. 
So Adam and I were talking before the podcast about how cool and rare it is when somebody says, here's what's going to happen. Here's what we're going to do. And then they actually go out and do it, right? So <laughs> yes. you did that. The proof is in the pudding. Um, there's been a lot written about and spoken about this unique approach to training and racing that 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 you guys have cultivated in, in this amazing partnership uh, through kind of you know, really understanding sports science and next level data mining and all the interesting things that you're doing. And that, of course, has resulted in a bit of a backlash. There's a lot of shit talking out there about the Norwegian train. (laughs) So I want to give you the opportunity to slap back a little bit. (laughs) Anything you want to say to all those detractors out there and, and any predictions about Kona and the kind of season that's continuing to unfold? I was actually thinking like two weeks ago, that uh, if I'm able to win Harris in George, then nobody has a chance in Hawaii. So we will <laughs> There <see>. it is. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we will see in five months' time if that's correct. Because um, I, I didn't really feel prepared. Uh, and uh, yeah, I will be prepared coming to Hawaii. There you have it. Very exciting. Uh, congratulations to both of you yeah. guys. It's it's really uh, a treat. Thanks for uh, thanks for making this work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, really appreciate you guys taking the time. It's been so fun uh, cheering you from afar and and watching you know all of this progress kind of unfold. Can't wait to see what you do in Kona. And at some point when you guys find yourselves in LA, we'd love to have you in the studio for a full blown podcast if you can make the time. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. All right. Hopefully there's a parade waiting for you in the Bergen airport when you land. (laughs) Yes. We are landing just before midnight tomorrow. So (laughs) (laughs) all right. Cool. Travel safe, guys. All right. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Wasn't that awesome talking to Christian and Olaf? (laughs) It was. It was amazing. We're laughing because we haven't recorded it yet. We're pretending like we just had that experience. Yeah, we're, you we're, will. You, the audience member, will have had that experience. You've had it. Yes. We have not. I hope it was good. I hope it was good for you. Um, there are a couple more stories from the world of endurance. We got to talk about this six-year-old kid who who ran the Flying Pig Marathon in Cincinnati. Right. What's your hot take? Um, it's not really my business on whether a certain six-year-old kid runs the mayor. I'm not going to be outraged by it or celebrated. It's all none of my business. Is that a good hot take? That is a hot take because you're kind of in the middle. I mean, I'm, I'm like, yeah. carry on. Carry on with your lives. So I'm, I'm, I will not judge all of you. This, this sort of lit up the internet uh, yes. <clears throat> the other week. Um, a lot of people had, had a lot to say about this, including people like Kara Goucher, Mm. I had Steve Magnus in here the other day, who's an elite track and field coach. He had some not so nice words about that. Is it a bad thing to do? Well, at six years old, it's not a great idea. No. And I think there was some indication. Obviously, I wasn't there. I don't know the parents. Um, The parents are defending their decision, uh, but there was some video and some sense that the kid was crying and like not into it. And like they kind of urged him to complete it. That's different. all of that, whether or not that's true or not, I'm not sure, but it's certainly somewhat controversial. And I, I you know, I don't think you can make the argument that it's healthy for a six-year-old to run a marathon. Um, certainly, if there's pressure on that young person, apparently it's a family full of very active people who are strivers and they all did the marathon together. So was there pressure on this young person to complete it um, in order to kind of get that parental approval? Who knows? Um, but right. maybe not wise. I think it would be prudent for race organizers to be more conscious about age minimums uh, and you know protecting the young people out there. Mm. So I just you know I'm I'm all for like getting young people out there and active and doing challenges, but I just don't think that that at that age something that challenging is in the child's best interest. Fair enough. That's my hot take. Good. Um, Can we celebrate Jackie Hunt Brersma? She completed her 104 marathons in 100 consecutive days. Unbelievable. Setting the record for the most marathons run on consecutive days by a woman. Mm -hmm. Um, And she did it as an amputee. She's been an amputee for five years. She lost the lower part of her left leg to cancer. She's also 46 years old and a mom. And she did it to uh, raise money. 
um, and she raised quite a bit of money. The late, by latest amount on her GoFundMe, looks like she's raised $194,080. Um, and those funds are directed towards this amputee prosthetics charity called Amputee Blade Runners, because those blades like that you see her, if you're watching this on YouTube, the kind of blade that she's running on yep. are super expensive. They're like 10 right. to 20 grand each. So, in, and insurance doesn't necessarily cover them. So, you know, to be able to uh, uh, create a fund that will make that more widely accessible to other active-minded amputees, I think is pretty cool. I and agree. Super inspiring. She was sharing the whole thing on social media every day. Another Unreal. marathon, fantastic. Shout out to uh, RXR Bar that matched donations uh, up to $104,000, which is what they what they donated to her GoFundMe. So if you want to learn more about Jackie, if you want to support her GoFundMe, there's links in the show notes. You can find her at NC Runner Jackie, J-A-C-K-Y on Instagram. And there's a bunch of news stories and we'll link those up in the show notes as well, including this piece in, in ESPN, which is pretty cool. So Very cool piece. So much love, Jackie. Um, uh, yes, and shout out to moms. I didn't get to do my Mother's Day thing as she's a mom, so I'm gonna take my opportunity. She used to like get the kids to school and then she was going off on marathons every day. Like yeah. that was her, that, that was, was her, her rhythm. She'd drop her kid off at school <laughs> yeah. and then she'd run a marathon yeah. and try to finish it in time to right. go pick her kid right, up. Right, right. Yeah. And so I, um, I just wanna say, if it wasn't for you moms, uh, we'd all be uh, still, we'd, we'd be cavemen. If it wasn't for the moms, we'd all still be cavemen is my point. <clears throat> At least the males would. Well, you wouldn't exist. Well, there's that. But I mean, I, me I don't mean the biological function of motherhood. Oh, you just mean, uh, you, you just, in, in unrefined. We'd be wild beasts. Yeah, I hear you. That. Yeah. I bet even like, the first cave painter, if it was if if it was a male, I bet the first cave painter was just like this goth vegan caveman that didn't want to go hunting. I and, doubt. I doubt. I doubt it. Vegan and 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 just lays it around the cave until his wife said, "You know what? Do something useful. You, either you paint that cave or you're out of here. <laughs> right. Do something with your time. I did not marry you for this. Right." Um, let's talk about, let's talk about William Gooch. Yeah, let's do again, it. You love right? William So Gooch. we, we brought him up the other week because he is the model slash ultra runner slash hype beast dude mm. who, uh, who supported Robbie Ballinger in his, uh, effort to outlast a Tesla in the hill country of Texas the mm. other week. Um, but Robbie had previously supported William in his effort to complete 48 marathons in 30 days, which was a challenge that he set out to accomplish uh, to memorialize his mother who died of cancer and to raise money for the Macmillan Cancer Support, which is a, a cancer charity in the UK. And there's a documentary that just came out about the 4830, it's called 4830. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. Here's a little, if you're watching on YouTube. Here's uh, here's a little link to the to the film. Uh, William posted a trailer for the video on his Instagram that I shared the other day, and it's pretty cool. So shout out to William. Check out the movie and all sales of the movie or or rental fees for the movie go directly to Macmillan Cancer Support. So it's it's basically a charitable affair and a cool movie to to, to boot. Um, also, Super I thought cool. it was cool that that uh, he's a Whoop athlete, and Whoop um, has this blog post where they chronicled the strain of running 48 marathons in 30 days. So they kind of tell his story, and then they have all of his data, Amazing. Um, which is pretty interesting to kind of take a look at. It's also cool how Whoop is doing more and more of this. They like they've got whoops on a lot of the cyclists from mm. these one day classics. And then you can kind of go and look at the data and see oh, what the cool. strain is and all of that sort of stuff, which I think is-, is If you want to geek out on, yeah, on your favorite athletes. Yeah, you that kind of stuff. So, I like that. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, man. What uh, else you got for me? I got this uh, wonderful surf photography book. It's an art book by Clark Little, The Art of the Waves. Clark uh, Little is a one of the great surf photographers. Um, came up, I think, with the the Kelly Slater crew and all them. And Kelly Slater actually does has a really well written forward mm -hmm. to this book. And it's 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 quite something. A lot of it is shore break. There's some landscape stuff, but I mean the overarching idea is to get the the reader or viewer 
into into a barrel. Mm -hmm. And he does that so many different ways. Like I've never actually, you can see it in films, you kind of see it, but like there's something about the still photography of actually getting to to get that perspective of being barreled, oh, that's which cool most of us will never yeah. experience. So I love that about this. That's this exactly book. what it looks like when I'm in the barrel. Yeah, this is, this is what it looks like when Rich is getting barreled. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I love it. I think it's really a great piece of work. The writing is exceptional. It's by um, Jamie Brissick does uh, a lot of the writing or does, I guess, with with Clark. Um, they collaborated. So congratulations. Did it just come out? Just, just came out. Oh, nice. It's, it's available everywhere. Um, oh. Congratulations to Clark and thanks for the book. Cool. It's awesome. And you got one more thing you wanted to share, right? And then the month of May, 100 mile challenge. So... There is a, a nonprofit called Give Back Homes. They are a charity founded and run by two former Tom's employees, one a guy named Blake Andrews and Caroline Pinal, who's a Rich Roll podcast listener, sister of Priscilla Shut Vega, up. friend of mine, and does PR in the environmental and social entrepreneurial space. Um, and they basically came up with a Tom's style business, or well, not business, theirs is a nonprofit, where they take the profits from real estate companies and they use them to build homes for um, you know, poor, disadvantaged, uh, marginal uh, communities and families in mm. the U.S. and abroad. A lot of times, it's in Central America, and so they partnered with with real estate agents, brokerages, companies. The agency, which is a, a Southern California real estate, uh, I guess, agency, is was their first partnership, and they have decided to. Uh, the agency is raising money through this month of May, hundred mile challenge. It's on. You can. It, they have a group on the Nike Run app. And that group uh, is where you can kind of join. And it's not too late, even though it's already May, it's not too late. And a lot of you runners can, can, can throw down 100 miles in three weeks. So the idea is you, you give $30 donation minimum um, on the agency's website, and we have the link for you. And that $30 donation, then you can also join. So you could also just donate. Um, I've donated, I'm not in the Nike run group, but I'm gonna do 100 miles. You can follow that. That's gonna happen for me on Strava. I just don't carry my phone with me everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I'm not doing the the, the run group, but, but that you could do it any way you like. And even um, Caroline has said, if you're curious about joining one of these build out um, trips, they do them all the time. They call them, uh, I guess, Group the groups of volunteers. That's who builds them, and so you can join. There's one. They're they're right now in El Salvador uh, in one week building some homes. And so if you if it's like a Habitat for Humanity, thing. right? Like a Jimmy Carter, yeah. Right, Habitat right, right. That's right. cool. So that's that. How long does it take them to build a home? I guess they build several homes work? in a week. Yeah, yeah. Because if she's there May fifth to ninth, right? Like that's only four days. They're gonna have some homes built. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know That's how cool. or why. It's a I've great idea. It. Yeah, it's cool, right? Um, nice. And do we want to throw her email? She put her email. You got her, You put her email on that. In yeah. The so Caroline cool at givebackhomes dot com. If you're if you're interested, if you don't go to the show notes, um, if you're interested in these trips, um, want to be a part of it, Caroline, spelled the the traditional way at givebackhomes dot com. Mm, cool. Sorry to interrupt the flow. We'll be right back with more awesome, but I wanna snag a moment to talk to you about the importance of nutrition. The thing is, most people I know actually already know how to eat better and aspire to incorporate more whole plants, more fruits, vegetables, seeds, beans, and legumes into their daily routine. Sadly, however, without the kitchen tools and support, very few end up sticking with it. So because adopting a plant-based diet transformed my life so profoundly. And because I want everybody to experience some version of what I've experienced, we decided to tackle and solve this very common problem. The solution we've devised, I'm proud to say, is the Plant Power Meal Planner, our affordable all-in-one digital platform that sets you up for nutrition excellence by providing access to thousands of highly customizable, super delicious, and easy to prepare plant-based recipes. Everything integrates with automatic grocery delivery and you get access to our amazing team of nutrition coaches seven days a week and many other features. To learn more and to sign up, visit meals.richroll.com. And right now for a limited time, we're offering $10 off an annual membership when you use the promo code RRHealth at checkout. This is life-changing stuff, people, for just $1.70 a week, literally the price of a cup of coffee. Again, that's meals.richroll.com, promo code RRHealth for $10 off an annual membership. All right. Let's get back to the show. Um, all right, well, why don't we turn our focus and attention to uh, 
you know, current events, things that are mm. on everybody's mind right now, obviously is what's happening with the potential overturning of Roe versus Wade. This is what everybody's talking about. This leaked draft opinion in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization found its way to Politico, and that story was published about a week ago, I think. Mm. Um, it lit the internet on fire and has really um, monopolized the news cycle. And look, you know, how do we talk about abortion? How do we talk about the right to choose, the right to life, and balance those considerations in a way that's nuanced and, and respectful? I mean, everybody has their opinion on this and their philosophical perspective. I'm certainly not here to change anybody's mind. I happen to be pro-choice. I have been for a very long time. I believe in a woman's right to choose. And the, the fact that this um, draft decision, which we have every reason to believe, uh, well, it's been legitimized by Alito as the real thing. Obviously yeah. it's a draft. So whatever happens and when it gets published will I assume be at least slightly different than what we've all seen to date. Um, is going to change the lay of the land in terms of a woman's right to choose. And, and I think there are far-reaching implications to this. I think it's interesting. Listen, I'm no constitutional scholar, but I did take constitutional law. Mm. I got a B in law school oh. in it. So you're getting <laughs> you're yeah. now getting some analysis from a guy that got a B in constitutional law. A B in law. con law. So basically what I'm saying is don't listen <laughs> take to me. Take it away. <laughs> but I do think it's, it, it's, you know, rather than like having a, a hyperbolic conversation about right. this, like let's look at what this decision was premised upon. Um, and I think it's interesting that, that the opinion uh, emanates from a perspective of not being persuaded by the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, which is kind of what Roe versus Wade rests on. Um, the idea that within the due process clause, there is this right to liberty and how strictly or broadly do we construe what liberty is? Does it, can it be inferred from the founders or from the constitutional text that from that we can create this, this zone of privacy, right? Well, Roe versus Wade says, yes, Alito and the five justices who are overturning Roe versus Wade say, not so fast. It's a much stricter constitutional interpretation, which is what conservatives do. They're strict constitutionalists. So this is what they're basing this opinion on. It's also interesting that it is a shirking of stare decisis, stare decisis being this preference that we give to settled law. Like if it's settled, we give it respect and we're, we're reluctant to overturn something that has been properly considered in the past. Mm. In the past, when um, old settled law decisions have been reversed, particularly in the civil rights sphere, it's traditionally been to expand rights. But here we have for, I think the very first time, um, a shirking of stare decisis deployed to restrict rights. And that's settled law, meaning the Supreme Court has ruled and then sometimes it was challenged and then ruled again. So after two rulings, is that considered settled law? I mean, I guess it depends on how you interpret that. Right. But in the case of Roe versus Wade, we're yeah. talking decades, right? right? It's been 40 or 50 right. years. Um, of it being considered settled law. And interestingly, in the confirmation hearings of many of these Trump appointees, they commented that Roe versus Wade was settled law. I know, so, they lied. You know, they said that, and now here we are. Yes. Um, you know, Trump packing the Supreme Court, this was the plan all along, and now we're seeing the results of, you know, those seeds that were sown quite some time ago. Mm. Um, I think what's also interesting about this is, is, uh, is the extent to which this could ultimately unravel other rights like same-sex marriage. I know you have thoughts on that. Yep. Um, and I think it's important just, you know, just so we're all on the same page and understand what we're talking about here, this doesn't outlaw abortion. It just prevents the federal government from making federal law regarding the policing of abortion. So essentially allows states to write their own laws. Yep. Um, it's going to trigger laws in states that have laws that pre that are pre-existing that will go into effect upon publication, and of course, this will have a disproportionate impact on poor uh, on poor people and people of color, particularly obviously in, in in red states. Yep. And I think it's interesting that this more restrictive or limited read 
of liberty or how we're defining liberty or thinking about liberty, the parameters of liberty are inconsistent with the other issues that conservatives or the right tend to care, care about. Like they want liberty when it comes to opposing mandates, for example, we've all seen that. And yet when it comes to and women's mandates? bodies and the unborn child, they want to undercut the woman's, the woman's liberty. So there is an inconsistency in um, that perspective or prioritization of liberty, depending upon, you know, who, who, who would be, you know, embodying that liberty, right? right? And also, the, and you, I mean, obviously it's a different amendment, but right to bear arms, they want liberty when it comes to guns, they want right. liberty when it comes to their choices they're in favor of, and they don't want liberty in this case. And, you know, there is some quid pro quo because the people who say it's my body, my choice when it comes to abortion aren't really stoked when people didn't want to wear masks. So there is right. a back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, you know, because human beings are inconsistent right. and emotional and irrational when it comes to these sorts of things. And you have what it looks like 19 states already have laws that will go into effect after this thing is published. Mm -hmm. 22, to, uh, 22 to 26 states might have some some issue. Right. Um, I think that there is there's still going to be like morning after pills still on the market in those states. Let's just kind of put out there. There's still access to um, uh, prescription drugs that that could help assist in unwanted pregnancy cases. Yeah, well, I think it, it's 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 interesting because in yeah. certain in a certain way you can say, well, we're moving backwards. We're going back to the 1930s, but right. it's not a situation in which there's gonna be coat hangers and back alleyways. Right. Like a lot of abortions are, as I understand it, um, conducted Chemically. through prescription, right. like through a, through a medication, a pharmaceutical, right. right? So the question then becomes, how restrictive is that medication and or what does the black market look like in terms of getting your hands on that medication? And what happens when somebody who isn't qualified is administering that medication or taking that medication because people aren't gonna stop getting abortions. It's just a question of how they're gonna be getting abortions. And I think it's interesting that we're seeing these, it's almost like, well, I think now that this is out, all these people feel emboldened to start talking about other laws that are, are even more um, extreme, like preventing, um, preventing pregnant women who are in these states where, where abortion is gonna be outlawed from crossing state lines. Mm -hmm. You've seen news stories about the potential illegality of contraception, IUDs, um, condoms. I mean, I I can't imagine that. But no. is this the world that we're now entering? I'm not sure. But it is it is strange. It's strange, and um, it is a law that I think you know. I think this decision really took everybody by surprise. I think everybody just thought this is settled law. The day would never come when Roe versus Wade would be overturned. And yet this has been the conservative agenda for a very long time. And now they're seeing it, you know, finally come to fruition. It's happened. Um, I think there's a couple of things. There, is, there are going to be more children. Uh, there's an economist at Middlebury College in Vermont named Caitlin Knowles Myers, who has studied for 15 years the impact of restrictive abortion laws on uh, women. And, and it basically, in her, she wrote a paper in 2017 that basically expanded access to abortion has reduced, reduced teen motherhood by 34%, reduced teen brides by 20%. Um, that she estimates 75,000 more births, births within a year to people who have otherwise considered abortion. Um, the big case, the big thing that I, I keep hearing and I think is legitimate is you are basically now forcing in, to, because of this one particular opinion that let's face it is rooted rooted in religion. Um, you are now forcing potentially forcing women to carry a baby for nine months, deliver that baby, and in some cases, unless they're you know okay with trying to put it up for adoption, which is its own uh, traumatic experience, uh, then raising the child sometimes as a single mom. So it's like you're you're you are you are controlling the life of women because of your religious beliefs. How is that any different from the, some of the stuff that we're outraged about? I mean, it's, it's outrageous. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. I, I, I don't look down on people's religious beliefs, but I don't expect your religious belief to then impact me. And so that's where I look at that. And, and in terms of, I don't, I'm not a, an alarmist. So this idea that it is going to, um, you know, same-sex marriage is next and contraception is after that. 
I don't actually think that will happen. I think that's, I don't even think same-sex marriage is, is going to be overturned. But the way this uh, ruling is written in the draft form anyway, it certainly opens the door for that. Yeah. And, and, and that's what's alarming. And there's, there's now talk, it actually opens the door to unturn, overturn other laws. There is uh, a story out of Texas that the governor there wants to, uh, what's his name, Greg? Abbott. Greg Abbott, the governor, now wants to sue to overturn a federal law that was settled at the Supreme Court level that um, demands that Texas educate the children of migrants, illegal immigrants in Texas are now going to, um, their children may not get educated in public schools there because of it. They, if he goes through with this mm -hmm. lawsuit, he, he talked about it at a press conference. He gave his legal opinion on how and why it could be overturned. Um, he has not, they have not filed suit yet. The state of Texas hasn't done that yet. But when I took, when I see this, uh, which 70% of the United States is against the overturning of Roe v. Wade, 70%, mm -hmm. you notice there's no, there's no uh, bragging going on in the Republican Party. Nobody is like bragging that we finally no, did it. Because no one it's, is celebrating. Well, it's so out of step right. with what polls indicate where the, the temperature of the American people are. So you have that, and then you have this, this actually this impulse, whether it's the lawsuit happens or not, this impulse to actually weaponize young children and the education of children. It makes me think two things. One is who runs for office to gain power to do that? Like who, like what is in the, the, the head of a person who runs for office and their big goal is to not educate kids? That's yeah. crazy. And the second is to me, whether it happens now, 10 years, 15 years, this is the beginning of the end of the Republican party. That's what I think. I think, I think everything's gonna be okay. I'm not an alarmist. I think it's all gonna be okay. And I think this is gonna be the beginning of the end of the Republican party. Well, it's certainly going to activate the Democrats and it's gonna marshal the interest of the independents. There's a lot of people in the middle who are undecided or waffle between parties, depending upon the election cycle and who's running. But this is such an emotional issue. And I think it's really gonna enervate certain aspects of the population who have been traditionally apathetic about their, their kind of you know, sort of uh, uh, um, citizen citizenship, mm -hmm. right? And their 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 enthusiasm around voting. Yeah. Um, the Democrats generally bungle these types of opportunities <laughs> to marshal yes. support. Yes. So we'll see what happens, but it's certainly an opportunity going into the midterms. And I think the kind of domino effect or downstream implications of this decision, which we're expecting will come out sometime in the next seven weeks, I think every time that we're in that position where the, because the Supreme Court rules like once or twice a week, right, on something, mm -hmm. every time they're about to make a ruling, like, is this gonna be it? Is this real? Um, is interesting because at least with respect to the same-sex marriage issue, although Alito says explicitly in the draft opinion that this should not be construed beyond the very special case of abortion because it involves the, you know, the unborn life, um, and shouldn't be, you know, the under the the kind of under underscoring law and the principles beneath their argument shouldn't be extrapolated to, to to apply to other issues. It's not a stretch to see how those legal arguments or the kind of logical through line that runs through this this um, majority opinion could not then be applied. To same sex marriage and mm. other civil rights issues could. that we could see becoming unraveled as a result of this. So it's interesting. I think it's also interesting that that I'm not sure that the Republican Party is is actually prepared for what will actually happen if this becomes law, because with the uh increase in the childbirth rate and the other things that you were just mentioning, we're gonna need federal and state programs to help manage all of this, right? And the right is less enthusiastic about funneling money into government programs to support these young mothers and the children, particularly, you know, if they wanna put them up for adoption and the like, like we're, we're gonna need social service support in order to manage this. The right doesn't like to give social service support. Yeah, I mean, so support. What? So, so right. all these people fall through the cracks. That's right. I mean, it's the same thing with, with, with school children, like, Actually, their presence in schools gives public school money. You know, get, like like you take people out, you actually hurt your own schools. It, it's always been it's it's a folding in of the fabric of the country. 
and it's because of me, mine, and uh, and this is what I believe. So there, you know, that kind of attitude has been the kind of on the conservative side for a long time. Now, on the other side of it, it's like, you know, uh, we don't want to overstate a winning argument. We don't want to say this means, you know, these other rights are going to be taken away because it's not necessarily true. So, like, I would just urge people who are having these discussions or posting about it or whatever. Um, Let's stick to the facts and the facts of the case are, look like Roe is going to be overturned. Let's just talk about that because we, you know, until the other things are actually under threat. Um, the only reason I brought up the Texas situation is because it's under threat because mm -hmm. Greg Abbott spoke about it. And so that's why I bring it up. But the other ones, we'll see. I mean, certainly the ruling leaves it open to possibility. Um, but just if it's just Roe alone, that's already... Um, you know, a lot of people are extremely troubled by it and 70% of the population disagrees with it. So, you know, it's a very mm -hmm. bizarre uh, thing to be kind of living through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, More will be revealed. More will be revealed. And just so uh, uh, you're not under the impression that I'm some kind of left-wing progressive shill, I think it's important to point out that Although I'm pro-choice, I'm not so crazy about this new Biden administration Ministry of Truth, the Disinformation Governance Board. This is news to you, right? Like it's, you weren't it's, aware I, I, this I, was I, going on. I wasn't on? aware, and it's a very bad yeah. title. It really is. It's a very bad yeah. title. <laughs> I mean, there's literally like the, the name of an Orwell biography is Ministry of Truth. Right. Like it could not be more it Orwellian couldn't be a in worse, that regard. Worse title. Who writes um, their titles? The Disinformation yeah. Governance Board. It's interesting because this. <clears throat> came out right in the wake, if I have my timeline right, of this speech that Obama recently gave at Stanford on misinformation and disinformation. Did right. you see that? I No, I, I, saw, I saw snippets of it. Um, I yeah. did not watch the whole speech. I mean, it's right. obviously, um, it is a problematic issue. We do need people, smart people, thinking about how to solve this problem. Um, I'm not saying it's not a problem. I'm just not crazy about this being part of the solution. Interesting side note, I was up in the Bay Area when I went to go to that, that doctor for my back appointment. Yeah. And I took Jaya with me and we were, I was, I was, I was giving a tour of like the, I was like, here's where I went to college. And we were driving around Stanford. And then as we're exiting, like behind Stanford, there was two cop cars and then four black SUVs and then another two cop cars. And I was like, who, somebody's in those, you know, I was like, who is that? Right. Like, it turned out it was Obama because he had just spoken at Stanford. Barack Obama. That so that was my 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 somewhat <laughs> fleeting <laughs> experience being close to Barack Obama. Anyway, not as close um, as to Larry Ellison buying cough drops. Yeah. So so this this disinformation governance board is is within the uh, Department of Homeland Security, and the problem is that it's run by people, right? And people obviously are prone to being emotional and partisan and susceptible to incentives. And the person who's been appointed to run this, Nina Jankowitz, is a very inherently partisan per person. I mean, she's an advocate for online regulation and stiffer action against online abuse, fine. But um, it, it's tricky, man. You know, when you get the government involved in saying what's disinformation and what's misinformation, right. alarm bells go off appropriately. Now, in right. fairness, the intention behind all of this is to identify and combat international threats, like coming from Russia and China. Right. This is something that Jankowitz has experience with, like this is her ex level of expertise. Okay. But anytime you vest a government department or organization with the power to make conclusions about what's true and what isn't, we should all be concerned about that. Yeah, no doubt. And it seems like it actually opens you up to vulnerabilities uh, politically by even getting involved in that, mm -hmm. you know, like, so, um, yeah, it doesn't sound good. I wouldn't want a ministry of truth <laughs> judging. Yeah. What, like, first of all, there's so much content. There's no way they could even, uh, I know. Who, who, who's going to judge it all? It's going to be AI. Who's controlling the AI? I mean, it's so inherently problematic. It's like, it seems like the the issue is an upstream issue. Let, let's fight misinformation before it happens. Let's fight, you know, like like what what's going? What, where does this lead? I mean, you have you have misinformation every day because we have an, a completely open media landscape now. Mm -hmm. 
you know, is it? Is, it's hard. It's a yeah. really hard problem. Right. On the one hand, it's incumbent upon all of us to be better filters of information and to develop and hone our critical thinking skills. That should be taught in schools right. now, given right. the fact that every kid is exposed to so much stuff. They need to understand how to distinguish between reality and fantasy, disinformation, et cetera. But we're also, you know, walking forward into this dystopian technological era of deep fakes. And, you know, what That's happens true. when technology advances to the point where you can put a video out of some head of state who looks and sounds exactly like the head of state who's sitting atop a nuclear arsenal and he says, I'm going to launch a first right. strike. Like, there are real world implications right. to this that kind of make it feel like, well, probably there should be some government organization that's paying attention to this. Right. So I understand that. But at the same time, like, it's pretty difficult to figure out how you solve this problem. Yeah, it, it, yeah, I mean, it depends on what the structure is. Like, what are they actually looking at? What's the purview? And then I think your 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 criticism of who's in charge of it it should it should it should look pretty impartial. It should look more impartial than, mm -hmm. than that. You know, like when, or at least it shouldn't be one person. Yeah, and maybe it's not. You know, like maybe it's not. I, I haven't really looked at it, but it doesn't sound. It sounds like it could be used <laughs> to accuse the government of censorship. And um, you don't want to be censoring right now. It's just like, I'm against censorship. You are too. We're free speech yeah. people. So uh, I wish there was a way to solve this problem um, without um, structure on, on speech. And hopefully there is. We'll see. Yeah. When Elon takes over Twitter. Maybe Elon can solve all these problems. Well, I think he thinks he can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get Elon over there. Talk, you know, now that Elon's a Texan, he can have a sit down with Greg Abbott. And uh, I'm sure know. he's had one, at least one. At least one already? Of course. Yeah. Well, he shouldn't I mean, be in his favor Gigafactory of this. out there is like the largest building in the world. Mm. It's a crazy, gigantic building that mm. goes on forever and ever. How come you don't so, have a Gigafactory? I have a Gigafactory in my mind. <laughs> All right, let's go to listener questions. Listener we're going to do one question and then we're going to we're going to pivot to our second Zoom call with Chris Hal. Hey Adam, hey Rich. My name is Tristan Dukes. I'm calling from Orem, Utah. Um, and my question is, so we're in a world of a lot of information. There's a lot of podcasts and you know a lot of things that I'm constantly learning and I would, you know, argue a lot of healthy things that I'm learning from your podcast um there's so many things that I want to implement in my life. Like I'd like to um, be more plant-based. I'd like to uh, stay consistent with intermittent fasting and those health benefits. And the list goes on of like things that I'd like to do or, oh, I should sleep between this time and get this, you know, but I can't help but feel overwhelmed at times with how much information or how many things that I should be doing or, you know, well, I, I shouldn't be eating fish because it's not sustainable. And, I feel like it's to my detriment and I try and focus on that 1% better every day. But um, ultimately I do feel overwhelmed with all the different things out in the world and the ways that I can better myself. And I guess I'm just wondering if you have any tips or tricks to bettering yourself in a way that is sustainable, um, that I can grow in ways that I can measure. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you, Tristan. Orem is where the Iron Cowboy lives. That's right. right? Shout out Iron Cowboy, who's going to Attila. Oh, he is? He's going to race the world championship. Oh, in good Attila. for him. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, isn't that cool? That'll They're be still... fun to see him do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, he'll love it. I think I he'll will. love it. Uh, yeah, spent a lot of time in Orem. Um, it's a beautiful place in the world. So thank you for your question, Tristan. Uh, yeah, it's like a, <clears throat> I, I relate to this a lot. It's like a classic case of whataboutism. Like every time you're doing a good thing, then you can think of the 10 things that you're not doing. Mm -hmm. Well, I should be doing this and I should be doing that. And you can easily turn that into, you know, kind of a self-flagellation parade, which I've been known to do to myself because it is so all, all you know, all consuming and overwhelming when you when you hear all this high vibration content and people are saying, do this, do that, do that. I mean, every week hosting this podcast, I learn new things from my guests and, and the other content that I consume. And it's impossible to incorporate all of it or synthesize it into my life or for anybody to do that. So you gotta be a little bit more sort of gracious with yourself, I think, because if you did 
set yourself up to try to follow everything. For example, just take morning routines. Like everybody likes to talk about morning routines. Like, well, if you did everything everybody told you to do for your morning routine, it would take you like three hours to do it every day. Like it's not sustainable. Yeah, Huberman, I don't have time. (laughs) <laughs> to stare into the sun I, when you wake up in the morning? I can't stare into the sun that long. Yeah. It's like, all of them are also like, it'll only take you a few minutes, but if you add, if you like made a list of, okay, I got to stare in the sun, I got to yeah. drink water with apple cider vinegar, then I got to do my meditation, and then I got to do right. my journaling, and then I got to do my visualization, and then I got to do my gratitude wow. list, and then I got to do my stretches right. or my, you know, Who it's like- time to work? Like, right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I love, I wanted to say that, it, like, I love that, that, you know, try to be 1% better every day mantra. Yeah. I think that's cool. And it's very, like, simplistic. So you can wrap your head around around it, but it actually isn't true. Like, no. I don't think anybody gets 1% better every day because improvement is not linear, let alone exponential. Life is messy and we make mistakes and most days it's you know two steps backwards i got four percent worse forward. yesterday did you no all the making up it'd be great like if you had <laughs> if there was an app and all it said it just gave you a percent every day of how much better or worse you are than the day before olaf could figure you're, that out he could tell us yeah. he could, uh, you're, yeah, you're four percent worse yeah. today like you're, i don't even need specifics yeah. just yeah, you're yeah, bad. You, you, it's not good. Yesterday was bad. You're 15% <laughs> the man you used to be. Right. Um, yeah, the pressure of that, right? Yeah. I gotta be 1% better every day. It's just, it, 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 it's, it's the pressure of unrealistic proportions. And so I think a better way to think about this that, that hopefully might be helpful to you, Tristan, and, and put your mind at ease a little bit is to just, first of all, create a hierarchy of needs. Like do a self-inventory and try to identify what is, most dire or in terms of your need to redress in your life? Like what is most urgent? Like where is that limited bandwidth, time and focus best invested that will kind of uh, be this fulcrum to leverage the most change? Because you can't do everything. And if you set yourself up to do too many things, you're going to fail for the reasons that you're already aware. So, you know, do that inventory and inventory your nutrition, your fitness, your mental health, your career, your relationships, how involved you are in your community, what does your spiritual life look like? Um, and 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 really be honest with yourself and try to figure out like, okay, where am I the most off the mark? Or where is the area that that I really haven't been giving the care and attention that it deserves? Um, and I think once you focus on that one thing and start to channel that focus in that direction, The cool thing is that it then opens up all kinds of other stuff because you're performing an esteemable act for yourself, which breeds self-esteem and gets you more emotionally connected and enthusiastic about improving other areas of your life. For example, if you pick diet and you start improving your diet, you start feeling better, maybe you lose a little bit of weight, you're gonna feel better and then you're gonna be like, I deserve good things in my life, where else can I improve? Because improvement feels good. But I think the important thing is to do something. It's not about necessarily what that thing is as much as it is about the fact that you are in action and not falling prey to analysis paralysis because you have this avalanche of inputs that are pulling you in a million different directions. Like the perfection uh, is the enemy of the good type. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, But that something should be specific. It should be measurable. It should be quantifiable. It should be time oriented. And it can be a small thing like 10 minutes of meditation a day. But as long as you're specific and you hold yourself to it, you're accountable to it. I think that is the key thing. And let go of this, whatever compulsion or need you have to like make sure that you're doing all of the things. So an example that I often give is is when I got sober, like I was like, I have to change my whole life. Like my life is a train wreck, it's a disaster. I need to, you know, change my diet and my career and like I need new friends. And in truth, all I needed to do then was to just stop drinking or not drink. Hmm. And so I focused on that because it was, I was told, I was like, I need to do all that. No, forget about all that. That will come in time. Right now, what you need to do is take care of the biggest crisis in your life which is the fact that you can't stop drinking, address that. And in time, 
you will get healthier and more, you'll be more capable of addressing those other areas in, in your life. Um, but I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have been successful if, or been able to achieve the things that I have, that I have been able to achieve if I tried to do all of it at one time. Yeah. So those are my thoughts. You're so good at these. You really are. Mm -hmm. You're good at these. Uh, they're thorny questions. This is a great question, by the way, because it, you know, it's, it's something, it's close to like, we've had overwhelmed questions before, but they're usually about how the world seems to be in, in, in a bit of a shit storm. This one's more internal, like, and you know, content that's coming at you. What do you do with it all? How do you catch it all? I really like this question, Tristan. And, um, I think, yeah, I think anybody who listens to a lot of like sort of self help, self improvement content yeah. or reads a lot of those books, you can get really disoriented because there's a lot of things to do and a yeah. lot of things to think about. Yeah. So great, great answers. Cool. So yeah, thanks for the question. And uh, that's it. I think we did it. Call us, guys. Send in some more oh, questions. Oh, that's right. Should we leave the voicemail? The voicemail. Four two four. Do you know the? You don't know it offhand. Uh, do, do I know it by heart? Yeah, no. you don't I have know it, it right hand? here. Four two four two three five four six two six. That's right. It's operators are standing by. Four two four two three five four six two six. AI is standing by. Right. Um, yeah, we love the questions. So keep them coming. Appreciate it. Adam mm. and I will be back here in two weeks. Uh, we're going to celebrate the tenth anniversary of Finding Ultra. So I have some fun stuff to oh, share nice. about that. It's been 10 years since that book came out. That's awesome. So we're going to do a little giveaway kind of thing. We'll talk about When's that. When's the last time, time you read it? A uh, long time ago. When I rewrote it a couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah, you had to do, a, yeah. you did a revise, right? I did a revise, You did a re yeah. reissue. But it's been 10 years and it's been cool Amazing. because it still sells and it still tracks on Amazon. And that's, that's the most gratifying thing because it wasn't a New York Times bestseller. It wasn't right. like a huge deal when it came out, but... It's still, you know, getting in the hands of, of people. And it's also interesting that despite its success, the number of people that have read that book is still uh, a tiny uh, segment of the podcast population, which right. shows you like how many people aren't reading books. Yeah, read more podcast read more. population. Yeah. Some of us rely on Need readers. you to. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us. I need you to read more. I have bills, <laughs> right? Um, cool. So we'll see you in two weeks. And now we're going to go to a, my conversation with Chris. I'm going to share about my back situation with him. Hopefully he has some words of wisdom for me as I try to my, wrap my head around whether I'm going to do this 20 kilometer race coming up in a month, mm. which is frightening me. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm eager to hear what he says and I'm, I'm sorry you're, you're having some pain. It's okay, man. I have some icy hot in my yeah. car. Do you? And I could a, use that. And one of those old school, like electric cord pad heating pads. Remember oh, you those? did? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've got three in my car. Do okay. you want one? No, I'm okay. Okay. All right. Thanks, man. See you in two weeks. All right. See you then. Peace. How's what are you feeling? I, <laughs> I've been better. <laughs> mm. Well, such is life. Life it, is not, life is is not linear. It is not linear. And the thing is, I believe, as I wrote you, I think you, uh, I think muscle memory and how this all works and your ability and open water and you're just, your calmness in that and not overthinking it, you can do it. I hear you. And I'm, I'm not averse to the Jesse Itzler school of <laughs> approaching, you know, crazy endurance events. And I know yeah. that I do have, you know, a background and a muscle memory. And even as the volume was starting to increase, like in the pool, the volume's never a problem with me. Like I can increase the volume, no problem. It's the intensity of the workouts that drain mm -hmm. me. And I'm totally fine for showing up and just spinning the wheel, but I need to calibrate that against whether I'm actually doing damage because my back yeah. was so bad. Like today's a little bit better, but the last four days, like I literally can't stand up straight. And I, the amount of pain shooting through my back is unbelievable. And there's no way that it's not tied to the swimming. And it's probably mm -hmm. mostly due to the turns. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as the workouts started to get progressively harder, it just, I couldn't get around it anymore. And it was like, it's, it's been excruciating. And so I haven't swum in like four days at this point. Mm. That's a bummer. That's yeah. a bummer. But the fact that this comes up from swimming is such a new, 
aspect of it, right? Like I've, I've had back issues before and like I'm sitting in the chair here and I'll get up and I'll like fall to my knees because I'm like this shooting like pain just grips me. And then I'm walking over around real hunched for a few minutes and have to stand somewhere. <laughs> so it's yeah. not unfamiliar. Um, but to me, it's never been a swimming question. Don't get me wrong. I jump in the pool and I'm very timid. Um, and by the time I get going, I'm probably doing some open turns or just not a lot of mo extraneous movements, but it usually always settles in on the swimming. Now running, forget it. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. Done. I can't get on a bike. Eventually I can get on a bike, but then I can't get off the bike. <laughs> right. <laughs> so this is, this is aging. Yes. Everybody I, watching I, and listening. I, beware. I know, I think, yeah. So, um. And the only other question for you is also, do you go all that way to do something where we inherently know you can do it, but, but I think the value of an adventure and an experience and something like this is, uh, it creates some momentum and it creates some powerful lasting energy within you. Yeah. And I think I just, uh, I hear all that and I appreciate it. I think I just need to see over the next week or so. Mm -hmm. Um, whether that's realistic, like, again, I just don't want to do increased damage to my back. Yeah. And I am like in the midst of this protocol where I have an opportunity to heal it with these doctors up your way. And I want to make sure that I'm following their advice because short of this working, like I'm looking at fusion surgery, which obviously I want to avoid at all costs. So yeah. I don't want to do anything that's going to slow down this recovery process or impede it in any mm -hmm. material way. All things being neutral, yeah, I'll go do some crazy thing and see if I can finish it. I just don't want to have any kind of permanent or semi-permanent damage as a result of being an idiot about like, you know, how I'm healing my back. Yeah. Are they saying this is all expected? Like what you're struggling with is part of the protocol slash what could be part of it? Well, what they said was that it's a slow process. It's not going to happen overnight. It's probably going to take about six months and, you know, two to three appointments where I go through this procedure and to temper my expectations of feeling any different in the short term. But they have seen good results as long as, you know, I'm doing what I'm being told to do. And, uh, and that I'm patient with the whole thing, but they didn't Not, make any guarantees either. They're yeah. like, you know, this is all kind of new stuff also. All I can tell you is that we've seen people who are in a similar situation that, that you're in and they've seen tremendous progress. And in terms of training, they're like, don't run. If you can ride your bike without significant pain, that's probably okay. Swimming's fine. Don't do flip turns. And I've sort of partially taken that advice. Like I have tried to do some tender flip turns and I think it is the arching of the back and the flipping over and the, the you know, the pushing off the wall. That's probably the primary culprit and what I'm experiencing now. But I've been dealing with back pain for like 10 years and it, you know, it flares up and it's moderate uh, lagging, you know, kind of all the time. But this was something totally different. Like it just hit a whole new level of excruciating. Mm -hmm. To where it's like, it's not even like, oh, I shouldn't go to the pool. It's like, no, there's no way that I could mm. do anything physical today. Hmm. That's a bummer. Yeah. That's, um, and so I can't even blame it on your past, your, your inability to do proper flip turns or something. Like that. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but this was meant to be like a coaching call where we're going to track the progress and like, yeah. here's what you need to be doing and all of that. But like, I think what's instructive for anybody who's listening or watching this is, like, how do you roll with something like this? How do you keep your head, you know, screwed on straight? How do you stay positive? Mm -hmm. And it just sucks when you've invested a bunch of time and energy and you have a goal and then you have a setback like this and it's unclear what the next right step is and how do you remain enthusiastic about your fitness when you're being told like you need to not do anything right now. It's very dispiriting. And as somebody like yourself who only feels good when they're in some kind of daily movement practice um, to not do that feels, you know, it feels like you're living somebody else's life. Yeah. I mean, for me, what I usually tell the athletes is this is a short window in time and these events aren't going anywhere. 
and we can find adventures, but let's get you healthy first. And let's, you know, work on those first steps in order to kick out the other side to make the decisions we would want to make in order to, for you to still have the experience, the adventure, that growth that you're looking for. Um, so that's the first part of it. The second part of it is also understanding that, you know, we can't force these things. And mm-hmm. sometimes the universe, for lack of a better description, conspires against our best intentions and our willingness to take action. Because here's the thing, right? We're taking action on the things that we said we would do. And you feel knocked down when when the action you're taking is detrimental to your what you envisioned would be your progress and who you want to be, right? And so, but knowing that there's another side to it, that on the other side of this, adventures will present themselves. I will say this, my greatest disappointments in athletics have always presented opportunities on the other side that allowed me to look back at the disappointments and say, wow, had I not had that disappointment, I would have not been able to experience this. Mm-hmm. And that mm-hmm. has sustained me and many athletes over time because the path, how we just sort of navigate that path presents an opportunity at some point where we all, if we are in the right place mentally too, can say, you know what? It actually worked out for the best. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's good to hear that. That's very reassur- reassuring. I appreciate that. I think it's, you know, for me, it's disappointing, but I'm in a very different place than I was in like 2009 or 2010. Like had we been in our like prep for Ultraman and something like this happened, I would have been devastated because yeah. I had so much, um, I had so such high expectations and so much of my life was invested in that at that time. Um, but now it's like, well, th- I'm doing this for the joy and the fun and the challenge and to stay connected to my fitness. And, you know, if it's not going to work out now, like that sucks, but I can live with it because I'm being nourished in my life and in, in other ways. It's just disappointing. And also I have to check myself from self-judgment. Like I'm somebody who, who if I say I'm going to do this thing, like I want to be the guy who does it. And then if you're like, well, I'm going to do this thing. And then you're like, well, now I'm not going to do this thing. Like that doesn't feel in alignment with like the kind of person that I want to be or how I want to, how I want to perceive myself or how I want others to perceive me. That was me last summer, Tahoe, Mm -hmm. right? I had trained, I'd done it and circumstances of being sick on, in that window had me getting out after, you know, 45 minutes or an hour, like, come on. And is that like a, that's kind of like a first for you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's brutal. Um, but I know that lake is still there and I know deep down inside, I will do that, still do that. I will follow through on my word. It's not Mm -hmm. a question of if it's a question of when. And so that, that is my anchor. That's what I hold on to. I will eventually follow through on the things that I said I would to myself, right? To, and to our own personal accountability, our word. And you know what I mean by that? Like we just say something to ourselves and we put our vested interest and our mind and our thoughts and our soul behind it. We are very connected to following through on that. Mm -hmm. But again, it's not a question of if that's the part we know. We know we will. It's a question of when, and you know, with the expectations around it of how. Of, okay, I, you know, I'm not expecting to win this, or I'm not expecting to set the record of, let's say, crossing Tahoe. It's a question of doing it, and I will follow through on my word on that. And similar to you, just think: ten years ago, or twelve years ago, had something gone wrong prior to your Ultraman buildup, you know, we would have applied that fitness in some other realm. And you would have had a very, who you were meant to be and where you are today. I think that path would have converged either way. We're just caught up in the event itself because that's what we're so laser focused on. But I think over time, you would have ended up with the same accomplishment and the same insights and the same growth and expressing who the truth of who you are anyways. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I believe I believe that. I believe that. I guess the question on when becomes for me in a specific way, 
Like, what does that mean? Like, let's assume my back starts to loosen up and it still hurts, but it's not as bad as it was a couple of days ago. When is it appropriate to try to push it and see what's going on there? Like, I'm pretty good about knowing the difference between just something you can ignore versus something that is truly problematic oh, yeah. that, that is going to be made worse by training. And that's a very kind of, you know, uh, personal connection that you have. But assuming I can get back in the water in the next couple of days, like what, what does that mean? And what does that look like? I guess I, I just have to play it day by day right now. You do, but you can also start wrapping your mind around. I need to only build once in our background for you and I as swimmers and just the experience of life, how many times we've trained for something, whether that's for Ultraman, whether that's for swimming, whether that's for any endurance event. So many of us are familiar with the old school way of you build, then you come down, you build even further, and you just build up your confidence and your ability closer and closer to said distance or event. And then you come down taper one last time and you do it. And you have this confidence that like I did, you know, 16,000 yards, I'll be fine doing 20, right? Mm -hmm. Or people getting ready for a marathon. Well, I need to run 22 to 23 miles just, and then, you know, come down from that. And that way I have that confidence in it. But there's also the other way that you build completely to that day. And that is the, that is the day that you do your biggest swim, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so we use the time we have available once you're able to swim again and feel connected to your stroke and your movements and so forth to sort of mathematically almost build back like, okay, how are we going to fit in some confidence building longer swims, get you to a point where you're like, all right, I can see how I can navigate a path and with my muscle memory and my experience to do this just mm -hmm. once. And that's on event day. Right. And what are the uh, mental coping strategies that you tell your athletes when they suddenly get injured and are, you know, spiraling out of control? Well, I use that time um, for them to work on the infrastructure around their training. Could they be eating better? Can they get more sleep? Can they do things at work so that they lighten up their load for when we do have the ability to train again? Can we take this time with kids and families so that we're sort of banking on time, knowing that those days are coming where we're going to have some longer days and everybody is on board sort of understanding like, all right, you know, this is his window or this is her window. We need to get the work done. But we, we had some amazing um, advancements in the infrastructure and our time together or weekends away until then, right? Um, mm -hmm. Investing in everything else besides your training and building up either goodwill or the infrastructure. The infrastructure to me is sleep and nutrition and hydration and mindset so that you say, all right, everything that I'll need then I am banking on now. The difficult hours or the the boring hours or for many people like on a trainer in a garage when after three hours, their brain's going a little cuckoo that they're like, well, you know what? Two weeks ago, I was dying to be able to do <laughs> three hours in right. the garage. Now right. I got to flip that switch and really sort of take that into a deeper level so that I have that available when the, when the difficult moments come up again. Yeah. Solid advice as always. Uh, before I let you go, you guys just did a big training camp up in Sonoma, right? How did yeah. that go? It looked, it looked beautiful. It was amazing. And we had a lot of fun. It was a really good infrastructure of a camp. And there's a lot of ideas and things you can do up in Sonoma because there's a 50 mile race literally on the shores of Lake Sonoma. Mm -hmm. There's tons of great bike rides. And of course, there's tons of great open water swimming and paddling and so forth. The challenge, as I would say, was more around what different athletes, when you put 12 athletes together, <laughs> what they perceive as ultra endurance is not quite what I perceive as ultra endurance. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, convincing them and, um, having them stick with it for three big full days is, the, is the challenge, right? That's where they're expanding on what they thought they were on who they knew themselves to be and discovering this version of themselves where it's like, I can't believe I'm still capable of doing a hundred mile bike ride after two huge days. I felt yeah. awful. I couldn't sleep and look, I was still able to get on my bike. And so 
that's the hardest work, I would say. It's not about the training. It's about shifting people's attitudes and mindset towards more. Right. But how empowering you get through that and you're like, I mean, I've had those breakthroughs and you're like, wow, I, that's something I never thought I would be able to do. And it just raises the ceiling on, on your own sense of personal capability. Yeah. And it's, and it's an experience that I want everybody to have, not even my athletes, when they just can see this version of themselves, this potential being unleashed, and then it expands in the other realms of their life, work and family and personal life and community, that they're capable of so much more than they thought. It's beautiful to see. And so this is just a small little window of to show them what they can do, what potential truly is. And unlocking that is awesome. I, it just makes my, I come home from these weekends completely invigorated. Yeah. That's cool, man. When's the next one? It's going to be a while. I'm too busy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm off to Jesse's uh, driveway to hell this week. So, oh, you're doing that, the thing in <laughs> Connecticut with the hill, you mean? Um, he has a new one. Um, it's in his driveway at his uh -huh. uh, Rome, Georgia place. And um, uh, it's a, <laughs> so he's got he a new one. He just did a weekend there. I was seeing on Instagram, like he got a bunch of guys out in the middle of nowhere with Chad Wright. Yeah, and testing. He was also there testing the driveway. And so it's um, a half marathon on the driveway straight up a hill. Like, <laughs> so I'm not doing Excellent, it, but man. I will be there to support. Gotcha. Well, yep. say hi to Jesse. And it's always good to talk to you. I appreciate the check-in. I'll of keep course. you posted. Who knows yeah. what's going to happen. And uh, for everybody who's watching and listening, you could find Chris at, at AIMP Coach on the internet or ampcoaching.com. And yep. uh, we'll talk to you again soon, my friend. All right. Hopefully you're in the water again next time and we're talking yardage. Hopefully, fingers crossed. We'll All see. Right. <laughs> yeah, keep you posted. Always appreciate your counsel. Thanks of so much, man. Of course. All right, man. Bye. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.